I suppose on some level, every actor aspires to be a chameleon, and by that measure, few are as gifted as Idris Elba. Think about it, he's nailed it as an American gangster. I gotta remind who the f you work for. A British detective. Everyone, take cover! A temporary boss at a paper company. Okay, so we're on the same page, great. Okay, so we're on the same page, great. Okay, Michael. Okay, Michael. No, seriously. Doing? Beyonce's husband. You are so bad. And a Norse frickin' god. Do you think that you can deceive me? Now, the real Idris Elba moved to the US from London, the city where he grew up, and, and his big break came on what might have been the greatest TV series ever, at least it was to me. Man, we done worrying about territory, man, what corner we got, what project. Game ain't about that no more. It's about product. That is The Wire. He was Stringer Bell, and he did it with such a dead-on American accent, nobody had any idea he was British. Adjourn your asses. So with the critics and the fans still obsessing over Stringer years later, how does he feel about the legacy of The Wire? Especially now that he's got so much else going on. He goes after Nick Cage, in a way, in Ghost Rider 2, and a few weeks back, he signed on to play Nelson Mandela in an upcoming film about the great Mandela's life. Now, for any actor, how daunting is that? Even one who scored a Golden Globe this year for his work on Luther, which is a BBC drama about a brilliant yet over the line detective. Stay away from Zoe! Oh, and in his spare time, Idris is a musician and DJ who often goes by the name Big Driss. Show me where you coming from, girl. Now he's in Canada shooting a movie called Pacific Rim. It's giant monsters versus giant robots. And if it sounds crazy, well, for Idris, it's just another transformation. Oh, what a treat. Please welcome Idris Elba! Oh. How are you, man? Hi, everyone. I'm good. Welcome. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm really good. It's glad oh, to be here. Happy to have you, man. You've been shooting in Canada for a bit, right? I have. I've been in Toronto Pinewood for about five months. What can you, what can you tell us I'm about Pacific I'm a native. Pacific I love it. You love it? That's right. <laughs> can you, what can you say about Pacific Rim? Can you talk about it? Uh, yeah, Guillermo del Toro. Um, he did, you know, Pan's Labyrinth. He's a uh, Hellboy. He's an amazing director. And, uh, you know, I was... He called me and said... This is a true story. He said, listen, uh, Tom Cruise doesn't want to do it, so I want you. <laughs> um, Just like that? I said, oh, OK. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. But uh, do you feel more or less pressure to take a role like that if it comes with the caveat that Tom Cruise said no? <laughs> um, actually, I'm not sure if that was a rumor or a joke. You know, Guillermo del Toro has a, a, a huge sense of humor. But, yeah, of course, you know, the role was a coveted role, mm -hmm. and I'm sure Tom would have loved to have done it. I'm sure they tried to work it out or whatever. But, um, yeah, the fact that, you know, you know, someone as big as Tom Cruise could have been playing this role, and here I am, uh, it does add a certain sort of uh, responsibility almost, you know? Sure. Good, uh, good sci-fi has to have a message behind it. Yeah. That's the art to good sci-fi. Yeah. That's important for, for your choices and films you make? Yeah, I think, you know, the films that I, I'm, I'm leaning towards, you know, like, you know, for most actors, you, you don't get to choose your roles. You know, you get a job, you work it, and you move on. Uh, and as, you know, you know, I sort of climb the ladder a little bit, I get to choose roles. So now I'm choosing films that have something to say. It's important, you know, if I'm going to spend two and a half hours watching a movie or an hour or whatever, I want a message from it. So, uh, and this film, it, although it's a huge sci-fi movie, it does a re really great human story in it. The, um, speaking of a movie with a message, I mean, you're gonna play Nelson Mandela. That, that's, that's some heavy duty, right? <laughs> Very. Yeah, I, um, I'm really excited about the opportunity to, to play Nelson. Have you ever met him? Like, no. will you get to meet him? I think I will get to meet him. That's... And he knows that I'm playing the part. And uh, there's a great story that the director, Justin Chadwick, told me. He said uh, he had the privilege of meeting Winnie Mandela and uh, Nelson's two daughters. And he said, he played the guessing game. He said, guess who's going to play your dad? And they all looked at each other and went, is it Idris Elba? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> Winnie Mandela knows me? That's amazing. Do you think and, she knows you from Luther or from The Wire? Um, I think it's Tyler Perry's film, Daddy's Little Girl. I really? think it's yeah. one of her favorite films. So uh, <laughs> that's an interesting <laughs> that's place to be. Yeah. You know, uh, you're getting this opportunity to go and play in this iconic figure. You've also had the, the joy of being an iconic guy in American television, and then you've been an, an, building an iconic role with Luther uh, in England. What's mm. your relationship like with the Stringer Bell thing? Because I've interviewed a lot of people who've played characters before that are memorable. But what? When Michael Kenneth Williams is on the show. When we told people you were coming on the show, 
people who love The Wire, it's a different relationship right. with the character. What is your relationship with it like now? Yeah, Stringer is, uh, you know, str you know, I I, pl I played Stringer at a time of my career when, you know, I'd moved to the States and I wasn't working. I was working prior in England, doing well, and then came to the States and didn't get a job for about four years, and Stringer was my lifeline. And then I played Stringer for about three years, and, you know, my relationship with the character with the show is that, first of all, it changed my life. But it continues to sort of like, everywhere I go still, and it's like seven years since I did the show, everywhere I go, there are still huge string of fans. And, you know, it just, it wows me that I touch so many people, that the writing, the characters in The Wire touch so many people. I mean, it wows me. The, um, the... We can't talk about how, what happens to Stringer Bell because it's, it, it's his own story there. But at a certain point when you're in a film like, and a show like that, do you become defiant about your character with the writers? Do you think you know what Stringer needs to be about? And I wonder if it's the same thing with Luther in your new show. Well, yeah, there's a, you know, what happens to Stringer in the end, in the end for some people who don't know, but, you know, there's, there's a certain sequence that Stringer goes through in the, third, in the third season. And I remember David Simon and I having a conversation about how we should portray this. And I had to fight. You fought him, eh? I had to. I mean, he, he had a, a certain idea of how Stringer should go out, which, and I was on the same page with him, Stringer should go out. But how was a, we had a little bit of a battle on. And yeah, of course, when, you are, when you've sort of worked on a character for three years and you're part owner of that character, you know, you are responsible, you feel like you are responsible for what happens to him. I know when people find out, first of all, that McNulty isn't American and you aren't American, it's a shock to them. So what's it like <laughs> the first time that I heard that you are like, what? <laughs> when you meet people and then and they go, string a bell, and then you, <laughs> they hear your voice, do you ever see a visceral reaction from them? Yeah, no, I, I mean, listen, for about two years after playing string, I had an identity crisis. I, I, didn't know what my, I didn't know what my own accent was. <laughs> Yeah. But I heard you auditioned with an American accent and the guys didn't even know you were, you were British beforehand. Yeah, no, they did for about, I did four auditions for it over a space of about two months. And it wasn't until the last audition, they were like, where are you from? <laughs> you know, do I lie? I've, I've been here three, three times already, do I lie? So I said, oh, I'm from East London, man. And he was like, wow. And then, they, you know, they were really impressed. Is it different for a different experience as a black actor in... England as opposed to a black actor in America? What's a black actor? <laughs> um, no, the... <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> no, but I know, obviously, no, yeah. yeah. No. The, the, the experience of, you know, in England, um, although very multicultural, right? Like, like Toronto, actually. Very multiracial and, and, and has a history of that. Wasn't actually represented in television as much. So, you know, we would see, we wouldn't see, you know, Afro-Caribbean people on television and characters as much as we'd like to, as much as we'd seen in, in America. So that was the main difference. However, the actual, you know, finding a job, getting a job, the politics surrounding being a black man in the film industry is all the same all over the world. Um, and, you know, so there was no, I didn't get to America and suddenly it was gravy. In fact, I got to America and didn't work for four years. Right. And, and partly is because my accent was terrible. Really? <laughs> yeah. So I practiced every day. Like, I lived in Brooklyn and Manhattan, and I just walk around with an American accent the whole time. It's actually, and it's not just acting for you, obviously, there's so many other things that your mu music's important to you. Uh, and you can follow, if you follow him on Twitter, um, you'll find out when you are DJing a set. <laughs> Here's some of him in action, by the way. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> DJing in Miami. <laughs> where, where did I get that shirt from? Look it's, at that shirt. That shirt's bright. You were DJing long before you were a famous actor, weren't you? Yeah, I started off DJing as, uh, as about 14 years old. My, my uncle was a DJ and he did weddings and, and christenings and he dragged me along and I ended up DJing for him when he had too much to drink. So <laughs> <laughs> that's a true story. And uh, so, yeah, but by the time I was 16, I was on like pirate radio um, and DJing in clubs and I just love doing it, you know? I, I, you know, I do it for the keeps my, my feet on the ground. Right. 
And by the way, you know, people, you've been out to clubs, you don't care who the DJ is half the time, you just want to dance, you know, so I love it. I love it. It keeps me alive. All right, stick around. We're going to talk about Britain, Beyonce, and Stringer Bell. More Anthropology <laughs> with Idris Elba after this. <laughs>